So tonight, our main speaker is Ethan Plout. He wrote a very interesting essay on technologies of silence. We met up in the mission, and here I can recount some of his really like uh, picaresque adventures. You know, he studied something kind of like symbolic systems of his own crafting at Northwestern, then lived in Cambodia and knows a heck of more than anyone else at our table did about the king and his heir. And lived in Cambodia for three years writing for journalists uh, or for, for some kind of local journal that everybody cared about if they knew who the king's name was. At any rate, he then came back, went to Stanford, and has for six, it took six years to get his PhD in some of the stuff he's going to be talking about. And he's uh, stayed on as a postdoc. And of the rest, I will be silent. Ethan. Thanks so much for that. <clears throat> Delicious. So, filters, really interesting. This one, mostly has uh, activated charcoal in it, which is made out of burnt coconuts, of all the things. And uh, it's a super porous material that has a huge surface area of hundreds of square meters per gram. And there's, this, there's a, a process called adsorption, which is kind of like absorption, but basically things stick to that surface area. In this case, uh, chlorine and zinc, mostly. There's other things in here. Uh, an ion exchange resin, which is artificially made, which, which takes up copper and mercury and cadmium. But there's a lot of things that are left behind. Uh, sodium, for example, doesn't get filtered out by a Brita. Now, that's a pretty useful thing, <laughs> right? And we have a lot of different kinds of filters. We can imagine one that's more sophisticated yet where we could customize it to take out this much of this element or leave this much of something else in our water. But there's a thing, there's a thing about filters, there's a certain limitation which is that this doesn't really help you if you're drowning, <laughs> right? Luckily, we have some other technologies, right? Like if you're drowning, maybe you, you need a snorkel, or scuba gear, or swim lessons, or a flotation device, or a boat. We also have warning signs to tell you if this isn't a safe place to swim, and massive infrastructure that prevents flooding. Not to mention government regulation, and all different kinds of ways that we draw a hard edge along that water that covers, you know, about 70% of the Earth's surface. So, why am I talking about this? I'm talking about this because I am drowning. Not in water, but in messages, in media, in communication. You know, emails are now counted in the trillions. We've gone from, uh, you know, <laughs> mega to giga to peta to exabytes and beyond. In some sense, this is an old story now. We often talk about it as information overload, but I think that term, it, it has certain limitations because it suggests that it's just a problem of reception, that you're overloaded by what is coming. But from my perspective, digital media is more like the latest wave that has come, and we need to remember that wave's attendant undertow, right? The thing that pulls back the incessant demand that we respond to messages. It seems like a lot of other people are drowning too. And they're trying to save themselves using filters, which is never going to work. Now, filters might be 
a better solution if people only experience media through one or a couple of screens. But that's not how it is these days, right? Our media comes at us so many different ways as we move through the world. Now, I'm not exactly trying to blame digital technology here. I want to be clear. You know, information overload, such as it is, it's quite old. You know, I mean, as early as the 16th century, people were claiming that there were too many books. So it's not like this is entirely new. And, you know, advertising has this amazing sort of horror vacuity where it finds a way to fill every blank space or empty moment. So I'm not saying that it's the technology's fault exactly. But with the rise of so-called ubiquitous technology, I am going to argue that we have perhaps slightly different, newer problems. But I'm also hopeful that we're going to find some new solutions. You know, no analogy is perfect. And this one uh, between filters reused for water and for information has its limitations. But I, th I think that it is useful and that there's a reason why, for example, we use the word pollution to talk about air, right? Air pollution to talk about water. We talk about water pollution, but also sound pollution, noise pollution, visual pollution, light pollution, as we can often see in the sky, being that we live in an urban area here. And one solution that people propose, or one set of solutions or framework for talking about solutions, is what has been called information environmentalism. You know, like other forms of environmentalism, I think information environmentalism is going to it's going to have to involve more responsibility from industry. But there will also be demands for government intervention and for individual people taking more and more control over the silences in their own lives. We're going to come back to that a little bit later in this presentation. But I want to start us again in a slightly different place with a guy named Max Picard. So. Picard is a, he's a philosopher. He wrote a, a beautiful book called The World of Silence. He writes, silence is nothing merely negative. It is not the mere absence of speech. It is a positive, a complete world in itself. So I don't want to get too deep <laughs> into, into Picard's argument, but I just wanted to pause on this and plant in your minds the idea that Silence isn't necessarily just an absence or a not doing, right? That silence is itself perhaps something that is palpable, that is valuable, that is righteous, that is so many things. Uh, Picard comes at this partly from a religious perspective, and it's definitely true that people of faith have particular concepts of silence as something that is substantial in itself. But I, I also don't think that they're, um, that those are the only ways to understand silence as meaningful. Picard also writes, all the other great phenomena have been appropriated by the world of profit and utility. Water and fire have been absorbed by the world of profit. Silence, however, stands outside the world of profit and utility. It cannot be exploited for profit. The thing is, I think he couldn't be more wrong <laughs> on this one. And uh, I also, I don't think that he was wrong in making a prediction. It's not that things have changed more recently. He was already wrong 60 years ago when he wrote this. You know, uh, silence has been for sale long before noise canceling headphones. And uh, it's, it's important, I think, to talk about silence and its relationship to socioeconomic inequality, OK? If you are poor, you are likely to live in a much noisier place. And that's not just a minor irritation, OK? There are a lot of, of really tragic effects of that. You know, first of all, health effects. You know, in Europe alone, it's estimated that just from traffic noise, there are millions of healthy life years lost annually. 
okay, major negative health effects. Uh, we can also talk about other things like education. You know, if you go to a school in a noisy part of town, you see worse education outcomes. This issue is actually even a lot older than that. You know, uh, you go all the way back to, to Rome and Greece, and there were people escaping the noise of the city to go to country estates because the clamor and hubbub of cities even then was too much for what they thought they needed to step back, to contemplate, to have an internal life. So I, I recently had the luxury of, of going to a hermitage down in Big Sur. I went for about three nights. And it's really, really lovely there. You know, I, I, had, I had my little room and uh, a little tiny, little tiny walled garden that faced the ocean. And uh, nobody to bother me, nobody to see me, nobody for me to see. I could just spend a little time look out at that water. And uh, it was a really wonderful experience. But I'm not, I'm not here to say that I'm coming back from the mountain with some wisdom that I'm going to impart. On the contrary, I mean, I had a good time, but I was still me. You know, I sat outside and I thought about things. I also, being a little bit too much people, unfortunately smashed one of their chairs while I was sitting outside. So I feel bad about that. It also interrupted my train of thought. But, uh, I, I do come back from the mountain with something else, which is, uh, it's a rough price list for what it costs to hang out up there. And I'll tell you what, uh, you don't get to stay in a place like that for less than $120, $130 a night. Now, that's not a crazy amount of money to the people in this room, perhaps, but for a lot of people it is. And so, you know, it's clear that privacy is both a right and a luxury good these days. People pay money to keep their lives private. And I'm going to suggest that the same thing is true of silence, that silence is both a human right and a luxury good, and that there's a very important tension in that, in that statement. <clears throat> so. Making our way through the introduction here, I'm going to talk a little bit about silence as a right. I'm going to talk for a few minutes about analog technologies of silence, just to sort of set the scene for a discussion about digital technologies of silence. And then we'll have a little bit of a conclusion, and hopefully there'll be some, some questions that I can answer. So nothing in this presentation or slideshow constitutes legal advice. I know this may sound silly, but you wouldn't believe how people get sued. I should also say I'm not a lawyer. So uh, even if it was legal advice, it would be a bad decision to take it. I am rather a scholar of communication. I am going to talk about laws and specifically about American constitutional law, but I do that really on route to something different, which is um, it's a way of organizing our ethical intuitions about communication and especially the avoidance thereof. You know, many Americans, I think, understand the right to silence through a very specific lens, which is cop shows. <laughs> uh, you know, so if, if you were going to arrest me, what would you say? Right. Anything you say can and will be used against you, so on and so forth. Now, that's an important thing, but the Miranda right is, is very particular. We associate it with the Fifth Amendment, which is the right not to incriminate oneself. But Miranda is much, much newer. Miranda is not straight from the Constitution. And originally, when we started having um, the, the kind of limits on station house questioning that today we call Miranda. They weren't even justified as being from the Fifth Amendment at all. They were originally justified as having to do with the 14th Amendment 
and specifically the due process clause. And if we're going to talk about the Fifth Amendment as well, it's quite complicated unto itself. So no person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. I want to focus on this word compelled for a second because our contemporary understanding of this law that if you're being tried, you can just sit there silently and have a lawyer basically speak on your behalf and handle your case wouldn't have made any historical sense at the time that this amendment was written. This testimony was not then as it is now. And people didn't usually even have lawyers. It, 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 it's something that is understood out of the original context in which it was written. Now, there are a number of scholars who suggest uh, that it is, it is better understood as having to do with this idea of a cruel trilemma, is what they call it. So when you swear an oath, you swear that oath on a Bible. And at this time, swearing an oath on a Bible was, uh, this was something people took very seriously. As many people would still take it seriously now, but in that moment, perhaps a bigger proportion of the population did. And the cruel trilemma is that once you're under oath, you either confess, or you're in contempt of court by not saying anything, or you suffer eternal damnation. And so the, the notion here is, is this idea of being compelled, that you cannot be forced in a criminal case to be a witness against yourself, because they understood that oath as being so serious that it was tantamount to torture, basically, to put someone on the stand. Now, there's another related right that's actually not even written in the Constitution, not explicitly in the, in the ways that we talk about it, which is um, the right to privacy. It's probably most famously formulated by Brandeis here. The makers of our Constitution conferred as against the government the right to be let alone, the most comprehensive of rights and the right most valued by civilized men. Every unjustifiable intrusion by the government upon the privacy of the individual must be deemed a violation of, drum roll please, the Fourth Amendment. So as we work our way through this, we've already had the, this sort of constellation of related rights to different kinds of silences justified by the 4th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendment. I'm going to propose something different today, uh, which is to organize these and other rights to silence as concomitant with the right to speech, as I prefer to interpret the First Amendment. Uh, although I'm, I'm really less interested in US law than I am in human rights. But this is all to say that I believe in a more general freedom of communication, right? Speaking and not speaking, listening and not listening, looking and not looking, typing and not typing are, for me, inseparable components of this more general right to communicate. You know, I'm not really arguing the intentions of the framers here. I'm rather arguing for what I think is a reasonable way to think about an attempt to balance the components of this larger, more inclusive right to communicate or concept of free speech. You know, there are also problems in the wording of the First Amendment. You know, we talk about the freedom of the press, which as a, as a former journalist, it, it, it pains me to talk about this in, in a particular way uh, because I love the freedom of the press. And yet, I'm not sure that we should be guaranteeing freedom to a specific machine, right? The press is the printing press. And I'm also not sure that we should be guaranteeing a particular business. It's kind of out of character for the framers to, to protect a particular industry or a particular machine. Um, and, you know, not for nothing, uh, you know, this, this, this famous saying, freedom of the press is guaranteed only to those who can own one, right? <laughs> 
you know, uh, I think that's that's famous for a good reason. And today we, we have a kind of update on that misunderstanding, which is people talk about things like internet freedom. That's not intelligible to me really as a concept because I don't think freedom inheres in a particular technology. So let's talk about how I do understand these rights. <clears throat> I'm going to walk through uh, a, a, couple of, a couple of little tables here. Bear with me. Uh, so here we have rights to speech and silence. We'll start with the right to speak, which here you can see is a sender's right to speech. This is the way it's commonly understood, right? This is the, the, the sort of normal understanding of the First Amendment. This is also the basis for our basically libertarian interpretation of free speech in America. I say what I want, right? But for me, that's not really meaningful without this second right, which is the right to hear. I mean, who cares if you have the right to speak if there's nobody around to listen to it? You know, the, the, this right to hear or to perhaps to listen is also related to things like the right to know or to be informed and to concepts like transparency, uh, which is very current right now in some circles. I think this is important, and yet, at the same time, it's fundamentally in conflict with and must be balanced against the next one, which is the right not to speak, the sender's right to silence, right? You know, uh, the, the right to remain silent, it, it's not just for self-incrimination. I believe that there's a more general right to be silent. There's scattered case law on this. You know, the one that people would know most commonly is that school children cannot be forced to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Right? It's a classic constitutional law case. Um, but cases like this are coming up all the time. So, uh, in coming up in July of this year in San Francisco, all Advertisements for soda, according to a new law, are going to be required to have these huge warnings against, uh, well, about uh, obesity and diabetes and tooth decay. But the soda producers are, are trying to work their way through the courts with a First Amendment defense. That may sound crazy, but we've been through this before. In 2009, we passed national legislation requiring uh, cigarette packages to be 50% visual warnings, uh, which, you know, if, if you've been a smoker in Canada, Australia, Brazil, Thailand, a number of other places, you know that's common in a lot of other countries. When you buy a pack of smokes, it's got someone cut open with black lungs on it to really give you a palpable sense of what that's going to do to your body. Uh, but that was struck down in the U.S. by the D.C. District Court. 2012 on First Amendment grounds. Uh, I also locate some, some privacy questions here. You know the current case about whether Apple should unlock an iPhone. In many ways it's very different, but fundamentally I identify that as an individual's right not to, not to communicate in the sense of not speaking, not sending messages, not revealing things about themselves. And so I would put it here, the right not to speak. And finally, uh, we have the right not to hear, not to see. Again, there's some sort of scattered case law about this. You know, uh, the government's not allowed to broadcast radio into public buses because there's too much potential for uh, propagandistic abuses. Uh, we also have things like uh, noise ordinances, you know, certain kinds of protections about what we're forced to hear. Uh, and then we have some really crazy laws. Um, in 2011, North Carolina passed a law that specified that women should be allowed to cover their eyes and ears when abortion doctors, as required by this same law, show them ultrasound images and play audio of the fetal heartbeat. Uh, luckily, that that was stopped um, when the Supreme Court declined to hear an appeal last year. But these rights are real. 
people are fighting over these day by day in the courts. And this isn't the only way to frame these rights. So we can talk about positive liberties and negative liberties. And positive liberties is typically something like a, a, a freedom to, a right to, whereas a, a negative liberty is more like a freedom from something. Uh, they're not easily comparable. It's not that one is necessarily stronger than the other, though oftentimes positive liberties are understood as being stronger than negative liberties. I'm just going to walk through this really quickly. Um, so here are those same rights framed as negative liberties, as freedoms from silence and speech. So here, you know, it's not the right to speak, but the freedom from prior restraint, not the right to hear, but the freedom from excommunication, not the right not to speak, but the freedom from compelled speech, not the right not to hear, but the freedom from audience captivity. It's another similar uh, frame that we can do in terms of attention, right? The right to be heard, the right to listen, the right to be ignored, the right to ignore. And then again, in terms of attention and inattention, the negative liberties, freedoms from cacophony, distraction, surveillance, compelled attention. I know I've moved through this pretty quickly. If we put all these charts on top of each other, we would, we would basically realize that we have a constellation of rights that are very, very closely related to each other. So here we can see that the right not to hear is quite similar to a freedom from audience captivity, is quite similar to a right to ignore, is quite similar to a freedom from coerced attention. And again, a right not to speak, a freedom from compelled speech, a right to be ignored, and a freedom from surveillance. You know, there are a lot of technologies of silence out there. We have, uh, we got earplugs, mute buttons, um, sensory deprivation tanks, anechoic chambers. I'm actually going to pick, uh, I'm going to pick a, a, a technology that's, it's so simple, it's like you almost don't want to call it a technology, um, which is this jar. Mm. Still delicious. So how many of y'all are familiar with the idea of the swear jar? All right, good couple people. So put one of these out, and anytime somebody's walking through and they say fuck, they gotta, gotta put a little money in there, okay? I welcome, after this thing is over, I welcome everybody to come up here and try it out. You can do a little swearing. Because, uh, <laughs> tell you the truth, I mean, academia ain't really paying the bills, so you'd help, help a brother out. Um, so, why am I talking about this when there's so many other technologies I could use? Because it is shorn of features. Because it is so simple in its physical form that as we watch communication happen around this object, we can learn a lot about technologies of silence that we can then apply to more complicated things that we're going to talk about in a minute. So, the swear jar, it, it transcends its name. It's only sometimes for swearing and only sometimes a jar. You know, in its, in its namesake form, it is a jar, put money in it for swearing. Um, the amount of the penalty may vary. There's a number of things that may vary. This has been overlooked as a communication technology. Um, I, this is actually pretty rare these days. You know, I mean, we, got, we have communication uh, scholarship books coming up, out about the earth and the sea and the sky as media. <laughs> I mean, if you can construe, construe something as being a medium or a communication technology, believe me, somebody's doing it. Uh, I think likely the reason why nobody would talk about this thing is because it doesn't send or receive messages. 
And when we talk about communication, that's really the, the driving concept of what a communication technology does. But I actually regard as artificial any distinction between a technology of science, a silence, and a technology of communication. For me, those things are fundamentally intertwined. Uh, I'd be happy to talk about that in the Q&A if people want to talk about it. Now, the earliest example of this thing, or something that's recognizable as being a precursor to this thing that I can find is from the 16th century, it was more akin to a, a kind of a wooden tithe box. But the, the man of the house was empowered to, to collect fines from you know, women and servants who swore, basically. And this, this gendered imagery persists in depictions of swear jars and swear jar-like objects uh, through, throughout history, uh, both, both fictional depictions and non-fictional depictions. But it's actually kind of interesting because sometimes women are cast as like the prudes in these narratives. All the, you know, the, the guys in the office are being naughty, and so the women are making them pay into the jar. And sometimes it's quite different, and they're actually cast more as, as the transgressive characters, right? They're, they're reveling in their indiscretions. They're enjoying paying money into that jar. Uh, I had a little cartoon here, 1914, from the magazine Punch. In the caption, the proprietor, who's, who's holding the box off there to the right, he says, there, Bill, that's a penny you owe to the Parsons swear box. And Bill says, I'd better do what I'd done afore, put our crown in and have a season ticket. <laughs> so this is not exactly a device for punishment and deterrence, right? Because he's paid ahead for 30 indecent outbursts, um, which probably lasts me about six or seven hours. Um, so let's, let's, let's step it back, because this is starting to get complicated already. And imagine an artificially simplified counterfactual case, right? So we have the jar, and there's one person, and they're alone in the apartment, and there's no telephones, internet, or other audio connections of any kind to the outside world. So in that case, the jar seems pretty clearly intended to prevent the production of messages rather than the, the reception of those messages, um, unless, you know, from your lips to God's ears, right? I mean, there, there are ways that we could, we could think our way out of that, but it, it seems like it's really there to limit production. And conscience is really the only enforcement. Now, you know, if, if you gotta pay 50 cents or $500, that changes the dynamic, but at the end of the day, it's still up to your own conscience. But once you have a partner or roommates or children, the jar likely becomes a restraint that's imposed on some people by others. You know, it's, it's more akin to censorship than to the, the sort of willful avoidance that I'm more interested in. And even if people are willing participants, the system is gonna set up these kind of wild imbalances. Some people got more cash than others. $5 might mean a lot more to an eight-year-old than to that person's mother or father. Another thing that people do is they'll set aside that money either for a favorite charity or for a trip or a purchase that's coming up. And you know, if you dread that purchase, that would create perhaps an extra level of deterrent. You might uh, even discourage other people from swearing to try and keep that jar light. But if you're excited about that purchase, you know, that creates a kind of perverse incentive to swear more. Maybe try and get your little brother to swear so he's got to pay into it. So now let, let, let me turn from, from the namesake swear jar to a kind of figurative concept. Because um, it need be a jar only by convention in some sense, right? Anything that holds money would suffice. You use an envelope, a drawer, a bank account, but physicality is still important. You know, a jar on the kitchen counter is very different from a jar in the living room. You know, a jar is mobile, but a drawer is stationary, and a bank account may not really have a physical presence in the house at all. I'll give you a funny example. There was this guy who had a really foul mouth, and the jar wasn't working, and so his wife wanted to upgrade 
And so she had this idea, we're going to take the money out and we're going to put something into that jar that's so horrible you wouldn't want to touch it. And every time you swear, you got to reach in and touch that thing. Their initial idea was to use a dog's heart, but they, uh, they decided instead to go with a live giant African millipede, uh, which grew to about a foot in length and it required an upgrade from jar to aquarium. So, you know, just as a jar is not always a jar, nor is it always a deterrent to swearing. I love this quote, this is from a nurse. She says, the kids have started a swear jar for me. Every time I talk about work, I have to put a dollar in it. In the space of two weeks, I think I got something like 60 bucks in there. So the, the, the sort of boundaries of the concept are unclear. It doesn't have to be a jar, and it doesn't have to be fiduciary in its functioning, and it doesn't have to be a deterrent to swearing. So what are we left? with what is a swear jar at this point right like it potentially includes most of law and order uh, but what's interesting that we can take away from this is that this apparently incidental little blockage to communication it starts to spread out into really complex systems and relationships between people when it's considered in context So <clears throat> the swear jar lives on in the digital era, <laughs> unsurprisingly. There have been a couple of good ones on Twitter. Uh, there was one that people set up where participating uh, people were charged one British pound every time they swore, and that money was automatically contributed to UNICEF's famine relief efforts in East Africa. There was one particularly generous and prolix donor who was awarded the top spot for cursing 424 times in his tweets. Uh, there's a similar project where uh, the user was able to select between different charities, uh, and they reportedly raised more than 34K. Again, here we see that perverse incentive that I was talking about before, where it doesn't seem to prevent people from saying that thing. It ultimately encourages them. And uh, not to be outdone, of course, there are so many iPhone apps based on this concept. It, it's a bit dizzying. We have the Swear Jar app, I Swear, the Global Swear Jar, Douchebag Jar, Curse Jar, Sin Jar, Vice Jar. The last one's actually pretty sophisticated. It, it connects to bank accounts and your GPS and to your other friends' phones. And uh, it has an elaborate reporting system. And it'll automatically transfer money and then lock it away for up to two years. Okay, let's get away from the swear jar for a second. So the, this, is a, this is an image from, from telecom operator Huawei's patent application for something called, and this is a really inspiring name, Method for Implementing Do Not Disturb Service and Intelligent Phone Terminal. Uh, so when we look at this image, what do we see? Well, you can set certain times of day and certain lists of contacts and whether those people should be able to call you at those times or not. In a sense, this is maybe pretty familiar. Something like this is pretty much built into the iPhone now. But one thing I would like to point out about it is that the wording is important, right? Blacklist, VIP list. These are really fraught terms, and I think it's important that we're careful about how we name these things. You know, when one thinks of a blacklist, you know, I, I, think, of, uh, I think of Hollywood under McCarthy. I think of all kinds of blacklists that I wouldn't want to be associated with. Um, VIP list is pretty funny, too. You know, if I'm out on Friday and I have turned off the, you know, a list of people, I don't want those people to call me because I'm off and I'm having a couple of drinks. It's probably very important people that are specifically those I want to block. <laughs> I don't want those important people calling me when I'm out. Okay, let's look at another one. So the, this is from Qualcomm's application uh, for controlling text messages on a mobile device. It's quite similar the thing here that's added is GPS, 
and the ability to control it not just by time but by location. When I'm at work, I don't want my friends to call me. When I'm at home, I don't want my boss to call me. When I'm at the synagogue or the movie theater, I don't want anybody to call me. You can program it so that it picks up where you are. Okay. Now, some of you are probably familiar with LeechBlock or Chrome Nanny. These are, these are browser plugins that allow you to to basically limit your own internet access. So you set it up and you say, well, midnight to 6 a.m., I want nothing but the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, uh, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., everything except Facebook. Okay, let's say Facebook for seven minutes every hour, and from you know 6 p.m. to midnight, uh, nothing but Netflix. And on Saturdays, nothing at all and on Sundays just gambling and pornography or whatever it is that you want to consume on any given day you can set it up but one thing that, that, that is fascinating to me about this is that you can also customize the difficulty of circumventing this block that you've created so so on leech block for example which is uh, it's one of the early and well-known ones it's a it's a plug in for Firefox, you can select a ran it will generate passwords of random characters of 32, 64, or 128 characters. So for you to get in, you got to sit there and peck out these randomly generated passwords. That's interesting in itself, but if you look on the comments page, uh, there's someone who said, oh, you got to double that to 256. And there's someone else who said, I really need a thousand character randomly generated password. So uh, this, is, this is quite funny to me in itself, but it also relates back to something from the jar, which was, it's the same thing, but you set the price point, right? If it's 50 cents or $500, it works very differently. Same deal, right? If, if you just have to do a little captcha, if you just have to do, you know, six characters, that doesn't cost you anything. If you had to sit there and peck out a thousand randomly generated characters on your keyboard, that's another, that's a whole other thing. These are examples of a more general concept. Uh, in, in economics, they, they would call it a commitment device. So a commitment device is something like a retirement account where you put money in there and then there's a penalty if you take it out. Or uh, if a pregnant woman says to her doctor, don't give me the drugs. I don't care how loud I yell. I don't want any painkillers. Okay, so these are commitment devices. What you're trying to do is control your own future self. You're saying, I don't trust Ethan of tomorrow to eat the healthy thing, to save that money, to to, to whatever it may be. In communication, uh, I think of this as, as communication avoidance. You might say it's the willful choice to limit one's own future communication choices, right? You're saying, I don't want that choice tomorrow because I'm going to make the wrong choice. But there, there are great risks with something like this. You know, leech block, it's also a kind of self-censorship. And it's not that different from technologies that parents could use on children or governments on citizens or bosses on employees. You know, even in some of those cases, we can imagine this working well and working to the benefit of everybody. You know, Volkswagen uh, in, in Germany did something very interesting, which is for a great uh, many employees, they turn off the email server a half hour after you're done for the day and they don't turn it back on until a half hour before you start the next day. Can you imagine? I mean, if Stanford University shut down their email servers from 6 p.m. to 7 a.m., people would mutiny. <gasps> um, and yet, and yet, how wonderful might that be? Now, of course, you could just ask employees to do that. Uh, that's, that's happened in France. Uh, people have been trying to trying to come to agreements that prevent people from being on email all night. But I have to say that 
that changing those cultural norms is really hard and that this institutional commitment that they've built into the communication infrastructure is, I think, it's likely to push along that cultural change that we probably need. Okay, we've been talking about these things that are kind of like filters. I'm just gonna take that to its logical end for a moment. There, there was another patent application that came from Qualcomm. And this is for a system that ranges across multiple different devices, your phone, your pad, your laptop. It's designed for parents to use on children. And it's set up so that the restrictions will change over the course of years as the children age. It will slowly open things up. But more than that, it also has these alg algorithmically generated restrictions. I, I just want to quote from the application because I, I, I couldn't say it any better. They say, a parent may select a parental control mobile device configuration that is automatically updated to include the most common settings used by, for example, parents who live in Oklahoma City and whose children are in the Boy Scouts. What a funny world that would create, right? Now I can, I, I find this absolutely terrifying. I think that you can end up in a, a world of, of filter bubbles, the likes of which Eli Pariser would not have imagined when he wrote his book. Uh, I can also imagine ways of subverting something like that. Like, uh, you know, if your friends had really diverse interests, maybe nothing would be excluded because there would be no most common settings. Or, Perhaps you could even turn something like this around and say, if something is blocked by all my friends so none of my friends are seeing it, I want it at the top of my list because that smells like a blind spot to me, right? A lot of different ways you could conceivably use technology like that, but it's, it's very easy for it to go wrong. Okay, having worked through, through filters, I just want to talk about some slightly more blunt technologies like blockers. So, so this is this is kind of a kind of a playful example. Kit Kat, maker of delicious candy bars, uh, had this little project. Uh, I, th I think it was just just in the Netherlands, but they set up these benches that blocked Wi-Fi signals. You could go sit there and be guaranteed that there was no Wi-Fi to interrupt your life. Uh, this, I'm pretty sure, would be illegal in the states. Uh, periodically, if you read the papers a lot, you'll see cases, it's, it's actually phone blockers that I see a lot. It'll be some guy who has like a cell blocker. It's oftentimes in his car because every day when he drives on the highway, he doesn't want people around him talking on the phone. I've seen like three different cases of this just in the last couple of years. So it's, it's illegal to block those kinds of signals in the States, but uh, an interesting idea in its way. Something a little bit simpler would be a safe. Evgeny Morozov, some of you probably know, quite famous uh, theorist, critic, uh, is not kidding, and I've actually talked to him about this, he's not kidding. He has a safe with a timer built into it, and he puts his router and his modem in the safe and closes it, and he'll set it to a couple of hours when he wants to write or when he wants to read something carefully, or when he wants to have a life that's not online for any reason at all. And what's really funny that you're seeing here is all these screwdrivers, and what happened there is that, so there's no code to get in. Like once you've locked it, it's locked. But if you use this, there's a way to get into it if you use a screwdriver. And so uh, it's happened on a couple of different occasions that he was like, oh, I blew it. I actually need to get online now. And so he had to leave his house and go get, like go buy a screwdriver. And every time that happens, his pile of screwdrivers gets bigger. And every time he uses it, he has to put all the screwdrivers <laughs> inside. So you can see um, the pile of screwdrivers has grown a little bit. Um, and we can go even simpler yet and just talk about a lock. Uh, I have this the classic one on the rotary phone, which I guess this probably makes me feel old, but I remember those. Uh, you know, Being at summer camp, they'd have one there so you couldn't use the phone, things like that. But there are other, other ways of just using a really simple lock. You can see people doing that here with, with power cords of different kinds. It's also not just software, which we've talked about a lot, and hardware, which we're talking about here. There's a lot of hardware solutions. You know, 
super glue in the Ethernet port is still very effective. Um, but also, also locations. You just up and go somewhere else, can't you? Now, th this is an interesting example. This is actually an advertisement um, that was put out for, for tourism to, to the Grenadines. And they had this whole campaign selling luxury vacations with the promise of disconnection. Come here to go offline. Would you believe that you can actually have someone meet you at the gate at the airport to confiscate your devices and they don't give them back until the day you're flying out? Now, it's a little bit comical, and yet, to a man like me, it's also kind of enticing <laughs> in an embarrassing way because I know if I have my devices around, I might be tempted to use them. So, you know, until the 19th century, there was this received wisdom among architects that when you're building a concert hall or another acoustic space, you should never use materials that absorb sound. That would be insane. You want more sound. But then in 1807, U.S. Capitol building opened. You may be picturing the one with the dome. It didn't. It was a different one because the British built, burnt it down in the War of 1812. But anyway, the U.S. Capitol building of 1807, uh, the members of the House of Representatives could not hear each other. And Benjamin Latrobe, who had supervised the construction, he realized that some echoes were undesirable, and he put in curtains. Uh, and what Latrobe said is, though there is less sound, there is much more heard, right? I think there's a lot in that. You know, we sometimes talk about the internet as being like an echo chamber. I go there and I yell things into it and nobody hears anything but the reverberation of noise, right? Um, I think that like Latrobe who who felt that suppressing certain sounds was a, a fundamental duty of architects, I think that you know, people who are building digital technologies have have a kind of obligation to help people not just speak, but also be able to hear. Also be able to not hear anything when they don't want to. Also to not speak when they don't want to, not to be leaking information that they would prefer to keep to themselves. You know, after Latrobe discovered those curtains over the next hundred years, cities got a lot louder. By 1930, there was a huge variety of acoustical building materials that were designed to absorb sound being produced by dozens of corporations. You know, I'm, I'm fascinated with this idea of these curtains on its own merit, but also I bring it up partly because it has this, this funny kind of spontaneous affinity with um, something related to this water analogy with, with which I open this talk. So, you know, there's, um, there's underwater noise pollution. It's a huge issue. Most of it comes from from boats, well, I mean, it comes from a lot of different sources, but boats are a major problem. Uh, also, underwater construction projects, like if you're doing some pile driving, you're building a bridge, just the vibration is enough to kill fish all around. And so they have this thing called a bubble curtain, which is so beautiful to me, right? It's just along the ocean floor and it just releases, it releases a little bit of air. Here's another, here's another view you can see it around a ship. There's two concentric curtains protecting, um, protecting life from the sound that's happening inside of there. Now, unfortunately, curtains, whether they're made out of cloth or bubbles, are not going to solve all of our problems. You know, solitude, like privacy, I think it really needs to be understood as a fundamental right rather than a luxury for the privileged. You know. We talk about internet addiction, information overload, as kind of diseases of affluence, right? Like those, those oh, those, those are, those are problems that rich people have. But I think in the long view, we're going to see that that's a mistake. You know, um, you know, it, it, it took not that long, you know, half a century for television to go from 
this is the technological marvel that will educate the masses to television is the scourge of the poor. It happened pretty fast. Uh, and, you know, there's other things that we think of as diseases of affluence like obesity and diabetes, which are also now spreading around the developing world. So as the digital divide, such as it is, shrinks, I'm afraid that opportunities for disconnection are not going to be equitably shared, just as opportunities for connection have not been equitably shared. And that that's going to open up just a, another new, different kind of digital divide of, of people who can afford privacy and solitude and other kinds of healthy silences and those who can't afford that. You know, ultimately, a robust solution is going to require individual, collective, and political action. I think government's got to play a role in this information environmentalism, if we want to call it that. But it's also really difficult to, to draw the line between that and censorship. It's so easy to get into a place where the government says, oh, we're, we're protecting you from something. You know, industry has a role to play too, but there's really no reason to expect that the free market is going to deliver a just distribution of silence to different kinds of people. Right now, you know, many individuals don't really have good tools for carving out silences in their own lives. And I think that's something that, that industry can really help to provide. But even if individuals did have such tools, it would be a disaster to let the world just get infinitely noisier and expect people to handle that for themselves. Um, you know, there, there have been some recent developments that are really disconcerting to me as I watch this. So we've been talking about these huh, filters and tools that block things. There have also been some things recently that don't just block it but transform it. The one I'm thinking of is, you, you may have seen in the news there was a plug-in that turned Donald Trump's name into somebody with tiny hands. And so like, if you're looking at the New York Times, it said, you know, somebody with tiny hands wins such and such a caucus. And there was another one that turned pictures of Trump into a profane emoticon, which I'm not going to show <laughs> on screen. Uh, and that, that may seem funny to us now, but you know, what if that software was turning Obama's name into racial epithets, right? What if it was saying, uh, oh, your baseball team didn't lose, they won. <laughs> you know, there are so many different ways that we can now algorithmically not just hide but also change what we're seeing um, and distort the world. You know, when the world is a mess, these means of escape from that mess are necessary, but they're also dangerous. There's an interesting comparison to be had, I think, with, um, with people who are deciding to live alone these days. This is something that's been coming for a long time. There's a great book that came out a few years ago called Going Solo, which I highly recommend. Um, we have an aging population. We have women who are more educated. We have more people who are divorced. We have all kinds of people who want to live alone for different reasons. And that doesn't mean living a lonely life, right? You know, just as avoiding communication doesn't mean an antisocial life. You could live alone and have a, 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 lo a lovely life. So just as architects will need to rethink housing for those who choose to live on their own, I think designers are going to need to rethink media for people who choose to tune out. And just as social services will need to adjust in order to serve the growing population of people who are living alone, communication policy will need to adjust in order to serve the growing population that is afflicted with overconnection in its many different flavors. So, you know, it's really only with individual will and the concerted support of institutions and each other, as well as new sets of tools that we haven't yet developed, that people will be able to truly exercise their rights to silence. Thank you very much. We're, we're recording for the podcast. Could you give me an example of when I might 
want to employ my right to be ignored. Good. Sure. Um, having a private conversation at a bar, picking your nose while you're driving on the highway. Uh, I mean, I, I would say most of my life <laughs> I would prefer to be ignored. I'm not sure that that, that may, maybe that means I'm a degenerate or something. But uh, I mean, I don't know. Do you want to be watched all the time? It's a distinction between privacy and the right to be ignored. No, I certainly want my right to privacy, but I'm having a hard time grappling with that concept of a right to be. I want a right to be ignored. I could take measures to do that. You know? Right. No. So th that's absolutely fair. And you know, you probably noted as I moved through all of those tables of different closely related rights that some of them are uh, sort of more easily relatable to uh, legal rights as we have them now and as we name them now. You know, the right to be ignored for me is closely related to, well, I mean, we, we've been through it, right? So uh, in some sense, maybe that is not a perfect way of framing that right. That's just a way of talking about that right with specific respect to attention as opposed to um, the the production of messages. So. so communication is really at the core of human evolution, right? From the first pictograms, first written language, Gutenberg's press, and then today Google, right? Major information sure. available. However, do you think we're coming to a point where too much communication is actually the opposite of evolution, and we need to get more silence towards evolution. I can give you one personal example. I work in healthcare, and mm -hmm. in the beginning, doctors required more and more information to do a proper diagnosis of disease. They said they need more medical images, they need prescription history, they need um, biological information from the patient and DNA information. But today, they get exabytes of information every day. Sure. So their decision making is actually more complicated because of all this information, it's actually contradicting the original diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Um, so, we are actually working towards improving some of that information so that we filter out all the noise. Right. So, do you agree that the constant evolution of technology and mankind will actually come from more filters, less noise, and a little bit more silence? So, uh, in broad strokes, I would agree with, with some of the spirit of what you're saying. Uh, I think that this problem of there being a lot of noise and a need to carve out silence is not an entirely new problem. I do think that with so-called ubiquitous technology, with the rise of the mobile phone, with all of these things that are now so familiar to us, that the number of messages we got to handle, clearly it's gone up. Like clearly it is now harder to carve out that silence. Uh, I think for a lot of people it has been hard for a long time. Uh, so I, I don't want to pretend that this is a totally new, a totally new thing. But but yeah, I, I tend to think that that's right. I also think that what you're talking about is partly the problems of of big data, which is a slightly different set of questions. Of okay, now we have so much information, we don't know how to sort it out. Is a little bit different from I have so many messages coming in, I don't know to which messages I should attend. But closely related. Closely. Hi, um, this is a fascinating talk. Thank you. I, I really enjoyed this. I'm wondering, do you think it would be accurate to generalize what you're saying as people should have the right to control the flow of information into and out of themselves, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, 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 um, Okay, so here, here we, get, we get into some tricky stuff. Um, do we think of communication as simply the sending and receiving of messages? Is that an adequate description for the process of communication, or is communication something that is subtler and happens uh, th through rituals and things that perhaps transcend the idea of messages coming and going, right? So I think the application 
of what I am saying to the ways that we construct devices that send and receive messages, absolutely what you're saying, uh, it, it seems dead on for me. Um, it, it sort of depends on how we want to define the idea of communication. I know that's a kind of annoying answer, but it, does that make sense? I think so. I, I'm just wondering, is the flow of information, is that equivalent to communication, or is communication one form of information flow? Mm. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I, th I think really we're into definitional problems here. I mean, it, so, so let, let me put it to you like this. Uh, there's a communication theorist I, I really adore named John Durham Peters, and his definition of, of, well, I mean, he gives different definitions, but one of his definitions that he gives is, um, it, it's the, the, the the struggle to reconcile self and other. Okay, communication is the thing I do to bridge the gap between us here. And if you define communication that way, it doesn't really sound like it's the same as information traveling over wires necessarily. So it, uh, I, I think we're we're really we're we're into terminological territory that's very hard to parse out. Um, you talked about the uh, um, some of the rights and uh, Fourth Amendment and, and um, um, like say there's the First Amendment, the right to free speech, but is there like um, like the right to protest? But is there a right, say for as someone is passing by, not to hear that protest and not and to silence it off, or or in a more generalized term, how um, how some people say, well, we have to educate certain people, but what if there's a person or, or a group that says, I don't want to be educated, I, I don't give a blank about it. Right, right, right. So, so from my perspective, none of these rights are really absolute rights. So, you know, when I say I have a right not to hear or not to listen or a right to silence, that doesn't mean that when I get up in the morning and walk through the world that the birds chirping are violating my rights, right? You know, I mean, there's a, there, there, there are boundaries around these issues. There's balancing questions between my right to speak and your right not to hear what I'm saying. And so um, uh, I know this isn't a totally satisfactory answer, but uh, I think that, you know, we, we live together. And my rights and your rights sometimes are going to be like that. And so balancing those, you know, that's... Um, that's what we're here to do, right? I mean, that's the hardest thing. I, I just want to call attention to the fact we almost got a contribution to the swear jar on that last question. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to, I guess, add to what, what you're just talking about. Um, so Reddit mm -hmm. recently had some changes to their community policy. Mm. Um, you familiar with it? You I'm to not. Talk about Go on. It? So um, they've recently added a block feature mm. and now reddit community the community is pretty there are some factions of the community they're very notorious on free speech rights mm -hmm. things like that and that's all fair and good but there's also a lot of problems with abuse and harassment mm -hmm. and so the block feature has been it's something that someone can say i want to block a particular user and that means that person doesn't know i'm not getting any information from them mm -hmm. but i don't have to see what they're saying mm -hmm. um and so it to me, it sounds like it's playing off that same thing where um, you can kind of have this weird balance between I can speak all I want and someone else can say, well, I choose not to listen to you, right? Yeah, and it, you know, on one hand, that's wonderful because that preserves people's right to speak and it preserves your you know, right not to have to listen to whatever profane or offensive or, or boring <laughs> thing that that person says, as the case may be. Uh, you know, there are ways in which we can run into trouble with that, right? If everybody starts to block serious news and just looks at pictures of kittens, like, okay, democracy burns, you know? Um, so, so the, the, I mean, that's, that's, that's a, that, uh, I should not be so flip about that. I'm actually very serious about this, but you know what I mean. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, and it's funny, this thing about they can't see that you have blocked them.
this other thing of whether other people can detect the ways that you are communicating is tricky. I was just talking with someone uh, before this about read receipts. I loathe read receipts. I don't want you to know that I've read your message because then there's this silence that I'm not responding and you're thinking, oh, he's read my message and he hasn't responded and then you start interpreting my silence but maybe I was just too busy. And for me, that's at a point where I actually just don't read a lot of messages because I don't want people to get a read receipt message that would let them know that I had read it, which is a little insane. Um, but, you know, certain platforms, <coughs> Facebook, don't let you turn off read receipts. So, uh, you know, that's, that's something that you can't control. So, Couple of questions. Um, so uh, there, are, uh, I'm really fascinated by the topic and uh, really appreciate this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. So it, it sound, uh, to, to me, uh, what's what's particularly valuable is to describe all the qualities of uh, communication and noise because. Um, I'm really interested in silence as, as a value that helps me uh, accomplish insight, recharge, um, uh, be healthy and uh, directed. So I think that uh, just like in Tibetan Book of the Dead, for example, where it's describing all of these different situations, uh, you're learning about life. So I'm really interested in kind of describing noise and communication and content to understand the degrees of silence. So you've kind of gone very broad about permissions and rights. So have you, um, have you uh, defined perhaps levels of silence? Uh, so a little bit yeah. more vertically. Okay. So. Uh, again, we start to get into sort of definitional problems because are we talking about silence as a physicist would understand it, which is vibration? Because if we're talking about silence in that way, then it's quite, well, it's not easy, but it is something that we can measure to some extent, that we can compare. Uh, we can also talk about, you know, human experiences of different sounds, which have been measured a great deal by psychologists and others. Um, you know, levels of ability to hear and deafness, right? So there's lots of different ways in which we would measure it in that sense. But the way that a physicist understands silence is like potentially different from the way that uh, a monk would understand silence is different from the way that John Cage would understand silence, right? And so uh, depending on how we're thinking about silence, it may be easier or harder to quantify or describe the level or purity or amount of silence that we're talking about. It's also worth saying that you will never experience complete silence, probably, unless you go completely deaf. You know, even if you go into an anechoic chamber, which is about the quietest place you could possibly go into, you will hear your heartbeat. Um, you know, I, I mean, true and total complete silence, I, I mean, I don't know if there's a physicist in here. I'm thinking it's probably at absolute zero, <laughs> right? It's when everything stops moving in any way at all. And so that's just not, that's, that's not something that we're ever going to experience in, in the way that, it, that a physicist would talk about it. Does that make sense? Well, I, I think I meant specifically in terms of pollution, oh. noise pollution, and then silence as a human value where I can uh, be healthy and um, clear the mind uh, and direct it. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, again, it's interesting. It sounds like you're approaching it partly from a spiritual angle, which I think is very hard to measure. Psychological. Psychological. So, so here's the thing is if, if we move it into psychology, we can talk about health outcomes, right? We can talk about how much traffic noise actually leads to people being less healthy. You know, I mean, there, there are some things that are measurable in that way as well. Going back to your topic of balancing different rights, um, 
when designing a telecommunication system, um, how do you balance the right, for example, to be ignored with the right to freedom or safety, for example? I want to be ignored, I want the NSA to listen to my text messages or what I do. So as, de as a designer, how do you, which one do you prioritize? How do you balance that? Oh man, uh, how, do, how do you do that? Very carefully. <laughs> um, I, I mean, look, I, you know, we're, we're going to keep having this fight as, as long as I am here um, listening to silence and noise and seeking out a quiet spot to sit and think about questions like that, you know? I mean, um, balancing safety and liberty, balancing, uh, you know, your right to privacy to, you know, our right not to have you do some insane thing. Th I mean, these are just, uh, that's something for which I have no easy answer. But I'll tell you what, I think we should all, you know, be able to carve out quiet time in which to contemplate those kinds of hard questions, right? Those are the kinds of questions for which we really need, um, you know, the distance from others to, to, to get with ourselves and think hard about, you know, what's important. All right. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>